So I welcome everybody and I'm looking forward to a very interesting uh, webinar, a side event of the DEPEP ministerial conference about eco-driving, all of the benefits, all of the activities and, and main uh, key parts of eco-driving. Uh, and you will hear a lot about that in, in quite a lot of uh, different presentations from international eco-driving initiatives. And we will also have a very strong and interesting part on driving schools, which are a very important multiplier for us and for, I think, all eco-driving programs, because if you can include eco-driving into driving school education, you can reach really a lot of learner drivers. So more about that later. I now uh, want to welcome my uh, Mr. Robin Krutak from the Ministry for Climate Action in Austria. He's working in the Department for Active Mobility and Mobility Management and they're leading eco-driving in Austria. Robin, you have the stage. Thank you, Reinhard. Thank you, Reinhard and Denise, also for solving all these technical problems. It has become quite difficult these days. Good afternoon, everybody, and a warm welcome to our eco-driving webinar, also on behalf of the Austrian Ministry for Climate Action. And welcome in my little home office studio here, close to Vienna. And I hope we're going to have a I want to say some introducing words. Um, eco driving always has been very much about learning from each other. And this is why we have this webinar also today. I remember we had a fantastic EU project some years ago. It was called Eco Driven. The 13 uh, European countries were working together on eco driving, and it was an uh, ongoing exchange of uh, experience and ideas on eco driving, and we profited very, very much from this project. We have learned, for instance, from Germany and the UK that this is possible to uh, conduct very short, intensive one-by-one -one trainings for eco-driving. That works also. Uh, for instance, we have learned from the Netherlands and Switzerland that with excellent marketing, it is also possible to motivate the very difficult group of private drivers for eco-driving. We have learned from our Greek colleagues that it's possible to do eco-driving with buses in big cities. And Germany, Austria, and many other countries proved that eco-driving is a perfect element for the education of our young drivers in driving schools. And nowadays, today, we deal with new topics. We really know, for instance, that eco-driving is a big issue also for electric vehicles. The driving style also for electric vehicles has a very strong influence on the energy consumption. And if you do it right, if you're an eco driver, you get a range extender free of charge for the electric vehicles. So eco driving was always about exchanging know-how between countries and the experts. That is why we found this partnership, the DEPEP partnership on eco driving in 2014. And this is a platform for the exchange of knowledge and experience for the successful implementation of eco-driving initiatives. What have we done so far? We have done some pilot trainings, for instance, in Kazakhstan, where we showed uh, bus drivers and also in driving schools how eco-driving works. We have done a pilot training in Kaliningrad also for, for bus drivers. Um, and uh, we have compiled all this knowledge and the experience we have at the moment in this first phase of the partnership in the, the BEP guidelines on eco-driving, which Reinhard will introduce to you in the next minutes. So finally, when it comes to climate protection, there are not many measures like eco-driving that are very, very cost effective, do not require new infrastructure or new vehicles, have the potential to reduce fuel consumption and thus also CO2 emissions by 10% and more. And that can be started anywhere in a very short period of time. 
such measures are very seldom in this world of climate protection and therefore we should use these measures. A request from my side, the partnership is open to your concerns and it lives from your interests. So you're invited to tell us what you need for your country to start or even improve an eco-driving initiative. Feel free to contact Reinhard or me and we, we want to prepare a next round of this partnership for the second half of this year. So I stop here. I'm very, very pleased that we have such a top class panel with experts from different areas here today. Thanks at this point to my colleague Reinhard Jelinek, who made this possible and organized this. And so I wish us a good session now and always shift gears early. Thank you very much. Very good point, Robin. <laughs> yeah, one of the main eco-driving tips. Um, thank you very much for your welcome speech. You mentioned that there are a lot of familiar people in the webinar. Also, I saw the chat is about the, the pity that we cannot drink a beer together after the, the webinar. So that's really a pity. Uh, some of the speakers, some of the participants have been working together also in European projects in the in previous years. And so if I'm really happy to, to see all these persons again and to hear about the recent uh, developments and outcomes. Yeah, uh, just start because I, uh, I fear that we will getting late as mostly in such webinars or seminars and I will try to share my screen now to start my presentation. So, okay. I hope that it's as large as possible for, for you. Probably if I skip Robin again, that the image might be uh, more large. I'm not sure if, if I can do something else on my laptop, laptop screen. It's, it's very uh, small now, but be, that's be, maybe because I'm the moderator. I hope that it's fine for everybody else. And I should know the slides, so I will uh, just uh, start my presentation. The PEP partnership on eco-driving, as uh, mentioned by Robin, is the, the background of the activities uh, which I will present on international level. And I will also give a, a small insight in, in eco-driving Austria initiative and also what is eco-driving about. I, believe that most of all will be familiar with the main issues, the main activities uh, of eco-driving, but I will try to give you a short overview in a nutshell. So, yeah, so I have to click here to change slides. Yeah, about the, the PEP partnership on eco-driving, it was launched, as Robin already mentioned, back in 2014. It's coordinated by Robert Thaler, who is also uh, acting as the chairman of the whole the PEP uh, program. And it's uh, very much about exchanging experience, exchanging know-how between the different eco-driving initiatives and also towards the countries where there are not yet any, any initiatives or uh, programs established. So a few slides about Klimaaktiv Mobil Eco-Driving Austria. It's uh, part of Klimaaktiv Mobil, the National Climate Action Program addressing clean mobility in Austria. It was uh, funded by the Austrian Ministry for Climate Action, launched already in 2004. So it's a very long lasting initiative, which is I think one of the main success factors for for it uh, for being still able to have a lot of influence it's very important to have a long lasting uh, program dealing with eco driving it contributes directly to implementing national policy and strategies it's uh, for example part of the national climate and energy strategy plan 
And uh, is, I want to underline that the strong cooperation with many partners of, of different sectors of the uh, Austrian Economic Chamber, from driving schools, from automobile clubs, from fleet associations, from the car industry, and, and authorities on federal and, fed, uh, and Austrian states level. So now, what is eco-driving about? What do we mean when we talk about eco-driving? Well, uh, first of all, I would say it's the smart and efficient driving style. It's the driving style which is really best for, for your vehicle and also for the driver and for going on. It's, it's just smart driving. Uh, what's important is that uh, it makes uh, optimum use of modern engines and of modern advanced vehicle technology. So uh, probably if you have uh, made your driving license back in the 60s, 70s or 80s, eco-driving will show you what the modern cars are best uh, driven with. Uh, we say it's feasible for all drivers, for all vehicles and all traffic conditions. It's uh, Sometimes drivers say I cannot use eco-driving when in congestion or intense traffic. We say of course you can change your driving style to a smart driving style also on the highway, intense traffic, congestion and so on. And what it's important to highlight all the time is that uh, you will reach your destination in equal or even reduced travel time. It does not mean driving slow, as some people might think. So why eco-driving? What are the benefits, the main benefits of eco-driving? Well, of course, uh, the costs and the uh, fuel, uh, the reduction of fuel consumption, reduction of costs for fuel, reduction of pollution, all this is in the range of around 10 to 25 percent. This is a, a practical experience, and we also uh, have um, have done some evaluation studies in different countries, and we see that's more or less the range uh, which can be achieved regarding reduction of fuel consumption. Of course, this depends on the current. Uh, driving style of the driver. We have experienced that some drivers after an eco-driving training has have a reduction of 40%, 45%, so that's also the case. Well, it does not only say fuel costs, but uh, also maintenance uh, uh, costs and accidents costs are reduced, so it means uh, generally are more safe driving styles and eco drivers also also look after their cars better and tend to enjoy driving more as other than other drivers as the technique reduce stress as well so there are lots of benefits uh, besides the one which I mentioned here uh, I also already mentioned increased traffic safety less noise more comfortable driving and of course, we are a climate protection program, so it's very important to be able to reduce CO2 emissions and uh, resulting in fewer toxic exhaust gases. And all these benefits uh, can achieved with a very soft measure. It's just about eco-driving trainings. We do not have to invest in, in very expensive uh, modern uh, engine or vehicle technology. We do not need to produce expensive electric cars to reduce emissions. We can reduce emissions just by quite uh, cheap training programs uh, in a range of around 10 to 25%. So that's an important message I would like to, to give. Yeah, we have uh, now three slides about the eco-driving techniques. There are of course a lot of, of uh, eco-driving tips and techniques which are uh, trained uh, in the eco-driving seminars with just, just a few examples. Uh, it's about anticipate the driving situation, anticipate the behavior of other road users, and to avoid unnecessarily acceleration and also braking. So to avoid braking, it's, uh, it's just uh, not about driving slow, but avoid braking and make uh, use, make best use of the vehicle's momentum, which you achieved because all the time you have to brake, you have to accelerate again. And this, of course, uh, results in, in uh, using fuel. 
Uh, second uh, slide on how to eco drive, maintain a steady speed, as Robin already mentioned, use a low revolutions per minute, shift up early. Uh, we re recommend around 2000 revolutions per minute. So that's the most efficient uh, engine revolution number. And some other examples which we want to uh, teach to the participants of a training course is check tire pressures frequently, avoid ancillary loads, don't carry your beer packages with you all the time, keep it at home and use it for the good. And uh, for example, turn off the engine at stops, which are, uh, modern cars, of course, do automatically. Uh, and one tip which is especially, inter, especially important for us in Austria, also consider not using the car, but consider using alternative means of transport, uh, such as cycling, walking, or public transport. Or if you need to use a car, consider use car sharing or carpooling. So that's, of course, an important message, message for us being a climate protection program. Uh, the four main pillars of the Eco Driving Austria program are uh, training and certification of trainers, of Eco Driving Trainers, train the trainer seminars where our master trainers uh, teach how to be an Eco Driving Trainer for the private and professional drivers. Second pillar would be Eco Driving Training for mostly professional drivers. Uh, we, in Austria, we do not focus so much on private drivers, but more on professional drivers, especially for buses and trucks. Third pillar would be uh, the driving schools, the integration of eco-driving from start of driving education into the driving schools. And the fourth pillar is a uh, strong focus in, in the latest years, e electric mobility, um, also the fleet conversion to uh, electric vehicles and how to use electric vehicles in the most efficient way. So uh, training programs are, have been established for cars on one side and for utility vehicles, trucks and buses on the other side, but uh, we also have established training programs for tractors and uh, for trams and, and uh, off-road vehicles. So there are, uh, in, pr in principle, you can use eco-driving for all vehicles with have a, which have an engine. Um, that's a very important slide, at least for me, how to change driving behavior, because I, I have presented some tips on eco-driving probably it's fine to give just a, a folder or a leaflet to, to a person, to a driver and say, yeah, please follow these tips. No, we think uh, eco-driving cannot be really uh, used, cannot be really um, uh, experienced uh, without a training seminar. It's not enough just to follow some tips, but you need to attend an eco-driving training to really change one's driving behavior. This training seminar must be given by a qualified eco-driving trainer. And at last, uh, the training uh, can include a theoretical part, but it needs to include also practical driving on, pub on public roads. So not only uh, on a closed uh, part of traffic, but really on public uh, roads in real practical driving to experience eco-driving. Yeah, uh, one slide about the training and certification of eco-driving trainers. We have a two-day seminars for 2B eco-driving trainers. They need also to do refreshment courses in Austria. And uh, we hand them over an, uh, a certificate. Uh, and uh, this is handed over by a, a high scale uh, person from the Ministry of Climate Action and sometimes even the minister him or herself in the moment uh, awards the certificates to the eco-driving trainers. And I forgot to mention it's also included an exam and examination after the training course. 
some figures on, on, on EcoDriving Austria Klima Active Mobile Program. We have now, since uh, more than 15 years, trained 1,800 EcoDriving trainers. We reach uh, 85,000 of learner drivers every year due to the integration of eco-driving into the driving schools. You will hear more about that about uh, for, from Stefan Ebner, who is representative of the, of the Austrian Driving Schools Association. Uh, we have reached uh, a couple of hundreds companies and public administrations, and we have now reach more than 25,000 competition participants, training participants, and so on. Uh, one example about so many examples about uh, eco-driving for companies, for businesses, is the Postbus company in Austria. Uh, we have a very long-lasting cooperation with the largest bus fleet in Austria, and we have trained now all 2,800 post boost drivers in Austria. There were a, a system of in-house eco-driving instructors established, and we have lots of fuel saving competitions to keep the motivation. And uh, the main result for the company owners is we reached a 2 million uh, liter of diesel reduction per year due to the eco-driving courses. And if you uh, calculate this into money, into euros, you see that it's really a very effectful policy, uh, both in terms of climate protection and also in terms of cost savings. So uh, one slide of my focus on uh, training for electric uh, vehicles. We will have one presentation about this from Bob Sainer from Energy Saving Trust later on. Uh, we would say in Austria, of course, uh, in electric mobility is more and more the big uh, uh, topic of the future. It will be much more significant even than today in, in very few years. Uh, we believe that the driving style influences consumption of electric cars even more than for petrol or diesel cars. Uh, we know that electric vehicles, it's not so much about the cost savings, but we can increase the range of electric vehicles. And this is, of course, a central factor for the acceptance of electromobility. And uh, we see electric uh, mobility eco-driving uh, also as a product training. So in an electric vehicle, there are new functions, new modes with no driver is familiar with. No one has ever recuperated before he first drives an electric car. Uh, we, we, we want to present also uh, what is uh, to avoid it and what is the best way to charge your, your electric car and all of the other aspects from, for which are relevant for a new electric car user. So, uh, now I come to the last part of my presentation after having given you a small insight into uh, what is eco-driving about. Of course, I could speak for one hour or even one day about the topic of eco-driving. I do not want to do that, of course, but we have compiled all the experiences from our program and also from other national initiatives and from the European projects uh, which I mentioned. You can see here the, the logo of the Ecowheel project, which was the last uh, European project, including some of the speaker who will be presenting after myself. And uh, this uh, guidelines now contains all the suggestions and recommendations, what is really important for establishing a successful national eco-driving initiatives in any of the TEPEP partner countries, uh, for instance, in the countries where there are no initiatives yet or are very small scale initiatives. So we want to give an, really an overview on all our most important uh, um, experiences and, and knowledge. And uh, the third point is that these uh, guidelines contain uh, recommendations for policy makers which will be adopted in the next uh, week at the high level TEPEP ministerial conference by the ministers of transport, health and environment of the TEPEP member countries. Uh, and now I will present yeah, 
I will later on present the recommendations. This is just an overview on the, on the uh, chapter of contents of the guidelines. So uh, in, in nine points, we tried to, to prepare all the basic information about uh, what, is, what makes an eco-driving initiative successful. So the Vienna Declaration, as mentioned, uh, this is a document which has now been prepared and discussed on, on high political political level, I think now for, for three or even four years. Uh, all of these words have been discussed uh, very precisely, I would say. And so it says the Vienna Declaration, the name is Building Forward Better, by transforming to new, clean, safe, healthy, inclusive mobility. So all of this is important for the, the PEP program and for the member countries. And it says, we, the ministers and heads of delegations and so on, we endorse, we support, we, we think this and that is important. And it now also says, endorse the practical results and recommendations of the partnership on eco-driving uh, including the guidelines which I have pre uh, presented before. And uh, it also says, we the minister signed that uh, we want to uh, enhance the partnership on eco-driving to explore uh, eco-driving to electric vehicles, other forms of transport, even non-road mobile machinery is mentioned here. So this is a, a very important um, outcome of, of the activities of the partnership. And this will really be signed next week by the ministers and all of the member countries of the PEP have done their official statements and eco-driving is endorsed by their ministers. Uh, that's the, the annex with the policy recommendations for eco-driving. So we compiled 10 main points this was also done together of course with, with other countries with other the pep uh, members uh, who have their experiences and, and insights uh, the main points of making eco-driving uh, successful the recommendations for policy makers and these are included as an annex in the vienna declaration so how can you find the, this, uh, the PEP guidelines for national eco-driving initiatives? It's a brand new document. It uh, will be presented the next week at the ministerial level, but it's already available for download or for a look at in the conference exhibition of the uh, conference tool, the Hopin tool, which uh, you are just now uh, are using. On the left side, you see the, the Expo button. If you click this button, but please do, don't do it now because then you will leave the webinar. After the webinar, I invite you to click the Expo button and to visit the Klima Aktiv Mobil virtual conference booth. And if you scroll down a bit, you see the, uh, the link to the, the PEP eco driving guidelines. So last but not least, I invite you again to contact the partnership on eco-driving. If you're uh, representing or if you're active in a TPEP member country, then please also become a member of the partnership. And I'm looking forward to a very fruitful cooperation and uh, more and more activities to come in the next years and to, to uh, bring eco-driving on the on the main track of transport and, and environmental and climate action policies in Europe and in the world in the next years. So thank you very much for uh, your uh, for for your attention, and uh, I hope that I'm still in time. Now I have uh, a little. I have taken a little bit longer than I supposed myself to to be. I'm sorry for that. So I just have a few, a quick look at the chat. Yeah, of course, I underscore the important step which is mentioned um, for eco-driving itself and of the, for the guidelines and the recommendations in the PEP ministerial conference. So uh, I would just like to change then to the second presentation which there will be now a block of uh, about 
of Germany. We will have three speakers from Germany. Germany has a very long established eco-driving initiatives. Actually, I think 25 or even 30 years ago, our master trainers went into school uh, with the German master trainers uh, and uh, the Germans teach us the basics about eco-driving. Um, so uh, I'm very interested about the recent activities which will be presented now by uh, Tarek Nassal, who I ask to introduce himself and, and give his presentation. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you very much for this interesting introduction to eco-driving. I am very impressed. Lots has happened. And uh, I have prepared this presentation in German. The slides are in English. I hope that is okay. Otherwise, I am really looking forward to having this opportunity today to speak in an international framework on eco-driving developments and uh, new information that we have. And together with my two colleagues, uh, Mr. Schulz from the DVR and Mr. Günther from Ruprecht Consult, we have prepared this presentation together and we want to tell you all about uh, our framework conditions and success factors for eco-driving in Germany. Let me just uh, start with um, the with um, championship from Cologne about um, savings and um, then Kai Schulz is going to speak about contents and the challenges that the teaching at eco driving trainings for e vehicles uh, has. And uh, then Henning Günther is going to speak about the institutional framework in Germany. Let us start with the Fuel Saving Championship in Cologne. It is an active campaign for small and medium-sized enterprises and uh, regional and local stakeholders in Cologne co-financed and supported this initiative. Implementing this ambitious uh, project was not possible with only our partners. We only we also were able to use um, some initiatives and research projects from the past in order to prepare this. The um, research of a large-scale team gave us some interesting information about uh, implementation and the success factors for fleets and companies. And this research con uh, concerned especially the DVR eco safety training, but it was, like I said, a fuel saving championship and a communication strategy of the company. And those two factors finally allowed a sustainable implementation of measures and also the sustainability of those effects in the company. And another learning from this project is that this fuel saving championship and the climate protection communication of the company had also other topics, but the participants found that safety mobility safety and traffic safety were a central topic. And 25% of the participants said that uh, prospective driving, which is an element of safe driving, was a focal point among those measures. So we had our magical triangle and we were able to prove it that was one of the most important topics here. 
we then transfer this to the campaign and try to move this to small and medium-sized companies. And the SMEs are a special target group. So there are five modules in this campaign, eco-driving, training, championships, communication, workshops on sustainable transport. And the most important module, from my point of view, a pillar of the whole campaign is advising and consulting how to implement training initiatives in small and medium-sized companies. We had this topic just a minute ago. Um, it was difficult in large companies. It was difficult to convince these large companies to train their employees. And this is even truer for small and medium-sized companies. It takes a huge effort to convince these companies of the benefits of this training. So I would say around 70% of the entire effort of this campaign was focused on these companies. So let's have a look. What exactly did we do? We had a number of events with some celebrities, local celebrities and local support. We ensured that the topic of sustainable mobility and eco-driving was discussed in these, during these events and that a large number of small and medium-sized companies were reached during these events. Then we had eight workshops, sustainability or climate protection workshops, um, in uh, teaching institutions. So we discussed climate protection. We trained climate protection ambassadors. This was very important to us. It was important to teach the upcoming generations who will work in SMEs and therefore familiarize them with this topic. And we wanted to look at the topic from different perspectives. That was one of the pillars that was very well received. So this module was contributed towards the success of the entire campaign. And at the heart of the project, we had around 190 eco-safety trainings in 32 companies and organizations. This led to savings of 12.4%. So on average, we reduced the average speed and there was enthusiastic feedback after the training. And during the championship, in city districts. And then we awarded the Cologne fuel saving um, champion. We also had 49 electric vehicle mobility trainings. So we had eco driving training for electric vehicles. These were developed during this campaign and fairly late. And we realized that there was a real need and demand for this kind of training. Um, our first polar test showed us that we could um, make savings of over 7%. But this was not at the forefront of the participants or the companies. They were, they, there was a certain prejudice towards electric, electric, electric vehicles, and we needed to address these. So 
these trainings are really in demand. Um, in any case, we learned that this new technology gives us easier access to companies. It is much easier here than with the traditional vehicles to gain access to companies. And what is the overall result? We have saved over 100 tons of CO2 emissions. That was a very good result. And um, the companies that participated, that was a very interesting insight for them. And finally, in the heads of many, this, the, the idea of saving CO2 emissions has really arrived. Internally, um, we who deal with the topic of eco-driving, we know about these benefits, but the reduction in CO2 emissions was always seen as a byproduct. It was never really at the forefront. But now, as part of the campaign, we have learned that this is an additional argument in our favor. So not only to point out the financial benefits, but also the emission-saving benefits. And in short, from our point of view, these are the most important points. Perhaps we can discuss this again later. From our point of view, it is very important that eco-driving forms part of the broader context of mobility. Eco-driving needs an institutional framework. It also needs detailed explanation and communication activities, especially for SMEs. Eco-driving also needs gamification like championships or apps that motivate people. And eco-driving also needs to prove safety benefits and long-term effects, for example, through the introduction of telematics during trainings. And eco-driving must address, address the current challenges and opportunities and find solutions. So that's it for my part. I would like to hand over now. Then, bedank, uh, then uh, thank you, Tarek, for the presentation. Thank you, Tarek, for your presentation. Uh, I, I, most of the, of the conclusions you mentioned are included in the in the, the PEP guidelines. Some of them would really be interesting to to discuss more further. Your experiences, for example, the gamification part, and I already liked your target group of the Climate for Future uh, kids because uh, we yes. have worked together within this the PEP conference. Uh, we have prepared some. Uh, youth participation activities, some youth forums, and there will also be a youth position paper handed over to the ministers next week, and, and that's a an, an very interesting target group indeed. Yeah, but now I would like to uh, welcome Kai Schulte from the uh, German Road Safety Council to give uh, his presentation about uh, eco-driving in Germany. Thank you, Kai. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yes, I would also like to uh, welcome all our participants. I can see a lot of familiar faces. As Tarek said, we want to say something about the challenges for eco-safety training for electric vehicles. So in the next slide... So we are talking about real challenges. Electric mobility is for many drivers, is a very new thing for many drivers. They have not experienced it. The possibilities that electric vehicles offer are largely unknown and they are not very well communicated. 
people don't know what possibilities exist in connection with this type of mobility. A number of drivers are also insecure when it comes to using these vehicles. So how should electric vehicles be used and driven? Also from the point of view of safety. And the fourth point is there are also new risks involved with e-mobility. So many drivers are not qualified to drive e-vehicles. E For example, the lack of noise is something we need to consider. And I would say that the use of electric vehicles needs different driving skills that traditional vehicles. And in terms of training that is available, we need to realize that we need qualified personnel to carry out this training. The next slide, we are talking about practical training. Please, the next slide. So we are talking about practical training on public roads. So what we have seen in all pretests and versions, we also need a theoretical tool like a knowledge box where we can tell people who want to use electric vehicles we can explain the basics to them. And then in the second part, in 70 or 80 minutes, they will receive training on public roads. So... So we need a knowledge box and then we need the practical training in real traffic. So we need a one-to-one -one situation, a trainer and one participant. The knowledge box contains things like charging stations. How do you actually lay a cable? How do you see that charging is actually taking place? And what does it mean to use electric vehicles under different external conditions? And how does this affect electricity consumption? We need to talk about internal conditions. So consumption, driving style, and we need to give them information about recuperation, about sailing, and the various instruments. Then in the second module, the practical part, there are four components. The first component is writing a circuit and to watch and see what competence, what skill does the driver have? Has recuperation already been used or not? Have they thought of certain safety issues? Then there will be a feedback discussion, a dialogue, so that you will discuss the driver's driving and then they will reach an agreement what would i have liked what would i like to learn by the end of the training then there will be a second drive around the same circuit so there will be coaching to increase the driver's skills and then there will be further feedback and dialogue to discuss the driving 
and give advice for the future? What are the central focal points of this training and what differentiates this kind of training? We need to focus on, on traffic scanning, so distance, looking ahead, and so forth. So we have to monitor traffic, but we need to scan the entire area and take into account other participants in the traffic. Um, so we need to consider that the driving is very quiet. This, the second point is to train with the drivers. How can you make use of recuperation? Because one idea of eco-driving is not to use the brakes, but to pedal drive as much as possible. And this can be done via recuperation and by reducing speed. And the third point, and we need to make clear that we have to increase the range of the car and to ensure safe driving. And finally, we had an initiative with Versiert that in future we have had initial tests, but we need to make this clearer in future and that participants are interested in achieving certain goals and increase their skills. Yes, thank you very much, Kai, for this insight into very practical uh, issues about eco-driving. I apologize again for the technical problems due to that and probably also due to my presentation. We are a little bit uh, late in time, so I uh, just want to change to the third uh, German presentation by Mr. Henning Günther, representing Ruprecht Consult in Germany. I know that Ruprecht Consult has carried out quite a lot of international European Union funded uh, projects about eco-driving. And I ask you to share your presentation, please. Oh, now it's working very well. That's great to see. Please, Henning. Thank you very much, Reinhard. Uh, okay, so the screen is apparently working. Uh, it's the correct slide that you are seeing, so that's good. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just like to uh, conclude now as a last presentation for the German block um, by giving a little bit of an insight into the influencing factors and the institutional framework for implementing eco-driving successfully in Germany. Um, just to show you a little bit about the background uh, where this uh, came from. So basically, uh, Germany has a climate protection program 2020. Uh, and part of that um, program is uh, also to, to identify the different measure areas uh, uh, through which then um, uh, transport uh, can be decarbonized. And as one of the single measures uh, that has been identified in that um, climate protection program, uh, you can see here on in the middle part, uh, Kraftstoffsparendes Fahren, so eco-driving, uh, being indicated with a certain uh, reduction potential, which we actually think is a little bit higher than that, but in any case. Um, and basically now the government wanted to find out how can we actually implement this and operationalize eco-driving on a national level. And that's why the uh, Environmental Protection Agency essentially contracted us to do this study and to um, essentially gather a group of experts. Uh, part of that has also been Tarek, uh, Kai, and also Reinhardt. 
Um, and essentially we organized a round table uh, in order, and you can see the full report um, and, and our recommendations here on the right, if you click on the link. And basically um, what, uh, what our job was to um, develop and prioritize different measures as part of eco-driving. And essentially we uh, differentiated into these different five uh, measure areas, training and qualification, incentive schemes, supporting technologies, awareness raising and campaigns and fleet management. And essentially the way we try to prioritize these different measures was by A, looking at what is realistically, uh, what can realistically be implemented, what is effective also in the long run. We have already heard that there's my, quite a difference between uh, short-term uh, effects and long-term effects, which measures are successful in the long run, and finally, uh, what measures are suitable for the different sectors, so for municipal fleets, public transport, private passenger cars, and freight transport. And this, uh, yeah, I'm just going to walk you through uh, essentially our four recommendations that we have developed. Some of them overlap with what uh, the previous speakers have already said, but maybe there's also a little bit of new information also in here. So first of all, we said, um, just like in Austria as well, um, uh, there's a need for a national platform for fuel efficiency. Um, and there's really a high need for institutionalizing and coordinating of regular exchange. And we really think this is uh, key to uh, have different stakeholders involved and at the table. So um, in our um, yeah, in our discussions, we try to involve really people from different kinds of sectors like industry, research, insurance companies and associations. And we really think that all their expertises are really needed in order to bring about a good eco-driving schemes. Uh, second is uh, that we said, okay, there needs to be uh, topic-specific working groups and regions also. So for instance, if you are someone who wants to uh, implement eco-driving in southern Germany, ideally there would be someone in Bavaria or Baden-Württemberg, for instance, whom you can contact and whom you can also um, uh, ask for support, etc. Same goes for northern Germany, etc. So ideally there are these regional contact points with whom you can get in touch as the experts to find more information and to find more materials. We also said um, there needs to be an information database and a platform. So really a lot of the resources uh, that are already available um, are not that easy to find in Germany. They are quite um, yeah, um, scattered um, by, by different actors. So there really needs to be a national platform and a database for all these kinds of resources that have already been created within the past 20, 30 years on eco-driving. And these resources needs to be free of charge, of course, that can be used then for training, um, but also provide, for instance, a few good practice examples. Uh, last but not least in this sector, um, uh, we have seen quite a few uh, marketing materials. Uh, and communication campaigns. But the thing is really that they become quite outdated relatively soon. So there's really a need also for having up-to-date and attractive marketing materials. Henning, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you. I see you have uh, three more points. Uh, I need to ask you to be a little bit more quick because we're really uh, a little bit late on time and I do not want to exceed the webinar too long. Thank you very sure much. Sure thing. Yeah. yeah. Then I'll just quickly walk you through the other slides. So our second recommendation is to uh, have a set of measures to support eco-driving initiatives for fleets. As quite somebody said, it's easier to um, implement eco-driving for fleets than for private users. So for this case here, we think there needs to be certification, uh, there needs to be training courses for fleet managers, uh, which can function as multipliers. Um, and also there needs to be an early involvement of employers' liability insurance associations, and you really need to emphasize the fact that eco-driving is also stress reduction. Uh, one good practice example is, of course, the Spritzbarmeisterschaft, which Tarek has already um, yeah, illustrated earlier. Third recommendation, modernization of trainings and qualifications for fuel-efficient driving. Um, there is um, green driver assistance systems, which are more and more um, applied in different sectors, like for uh, fleets, uh, also in public transport and more and more. And we really think this is something that should be made more use of, uh, but also new teaching methods like e-learning and simulators. These are good ways really to perpetuate the short-term effects and make, make them also more sustainable in the long run. Uh, last recommendation, 
and yeah, feel free to take a look at these slides uh, afterwards in detail. Uh, last recommendation from our side is the promotion of driver assistance systems and telematics-based services to support fuel-efficient driving. Now, for fleet users, we do see quite a big potential for smaller vehicles, so the ones up to 3.5 ton vehicles. Uh, whereas for the heavy-duty truck fleets, uh, there's already quite a big percentage of um, uh, trucks being equipped with um, green driver assistance systems. Uh, in public transport, we do see that more and more coming now, especially because of electric mobility uh, and the longer battery lifetime that you can reach through uh, green driver assistance systems. And for private users, I think there's still um, some research to be done. Uh, some more practice, uh, practical knowledge to be gained within the next years, especially regarding insurance and tariff models. I think this is a relatively new field for which we do need a little bit more um, research and, and practical knowledge, actually. Uh, last but not least, I just want to quickly highlight the fact that we are currently involved and run a international capacity building on electric mobility, also including eco-driving. Um, so feel free to take a look at this um, current European research project, which is going on, which deals with the electric mobility and electrification of, of fleets uh, around the world. You can see the different uh, use cases down here on the map in the middle. And we are really developing and, and collecting a lot of materials from all of these cities and, and their um, experiences with um, bringing about electric fleets. Um, and we will have a second course of this learning program, which will run in uh, October 21. So stay tuned for that. It, it will be on public transport and we will also have some training on eco-driving. And yeah, that was my last slide. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll give back to Reinhard now. Yeah, thank you very much, Henning, <clears throat> also for your for a quick finish of your presentation. Um, you said that a lot of more research and, and uh, activities need to go on. I think that's a good point, and I hope that we can really uh, re-establish the European cooperation within this DPEP uh, partnership on eco-driving in the future months and years to come. Um, I will uh, now invite a regular Zehnder from Switzerland, from the Quality Alliance EcoDrive in Switzerland, to give us uh, insight into the activities in Switzerland. Yeah, Regular, hello. Please genau. <laughs> just hello check if everything me. works. Genau. Denise, can you please share the presentation for me? So, hello from Switzerland in the name of our EcoDrive initiative. EcoDrive. I hope it's working. Wonderful. So you know that we are all working in our association EcoDrive. We were mandated to, to disseminate EcoDrive in Switzerland. And I can only uh, join my previous speakers that we are doing exactly the same thing in Switzerland. We are raising awareness. We're trying to instruct drivers. And how are we doing that? Our work is exactly the same as uh, others. We have uh, classes and trainings that uh, we uh, give and we also certify our participants. We are also organizing education and further training for experts. An important point is that we provide uh, all information and different tools and um, also um, new uh, insights, new systems, new assistance systems. The hub for all this information is our website, which we are updating regularly. This is the mandatory program and an important focus of our work that I am going to concentrate on in my next slide is um, to work with drivers, with pro programs for drivers, with incentives also.
You, we know that the technology is making great progress and that uh, assistance systems support what we are doing. But in our analysis, we realize that we expect maybe too much from technology. We are convinced that in the coming years, drivers are going to be at the center of what we are doing and are going to be more proactive and prospective. In Switzerland, the average age of the car is 8.7 years and the renewal of the vehicle fleet takes a lot of time in order to include newest technology. Our work with limited means is a network. We have a long, many years of partnership. We have our certified trainers. You can see here we have around 800 certified EcoDrive trainers who work on our behalf and carry out these Eco drive trainings. So we have around 80,000 new eco drivers in Switzerland. I can say our partners are very important to us because they help us. These are all our partners in Switzerland. Together with them, we carry out our activities. And together with us, they include uh, customers as well. The next slide, in the name of Energy Switzerland, we have a three-year strategy period. So let's look back to the last strategy period from 2018 to 2020. Besides all the training activities, we had the EcoDrive Rally. It was, there was an online quiz. For three weeks, every day, people could ask questions on the topic of eco-driving. Every day, we had, there were prizes to be won. And in Langdorf, we were able to hand over a lovely Toyota. We had a total of 190,000 participants and 3.9 million questions answered. So it begs the question, how efficient is this? Is this like training someone in a car on the road? but people were able to click on the tips and this would lead them to our website and, and per click and tip, people were there for about two minutes, which is a rather intensive amount of time where they were able to absorb a certain amount of information. So the next slide... In Switzerland, we share eco-driving tips with short films. These are all on our website. These 12 tips have been animated in 30-second clips. They are on our website. And all our partners are allowed to show these clips. They are in French. German, and Italian. If anyone is interested, feel free to have a look. There was also an online campaign via YouTube last summer, and in one month, they had 2.6 million completed views. These are impressive numbers, and we can assume that one or the other 
viewer learned something. So now I will look to the future. Our new strategy period 2021 to 2023 has been launched. So we have a motto. We can, every leader counts, reducing CO2 together. We believe that with all the technological innovations that everyone can make a contribution to this. It's if I alone turn off my engine, it doesn't really make a difference. But if all participants, fleet managers, driving instructors, and every single driver participates, then something can really be achieved. Next slide. So what does this mean in concrete terms? In the next three years, we are looking at a number of indicators. So concrete, I, I would say we will have an online tool called Class Time. So we will discuss topics relating to eco-driving. The same we will do in a test for new drivers. They will be incentivized through a competition where they can ask, answer questions, and then you can win a prize. With fleet managers, we are looking at events. Another project is also interesting where we will train those responsible for apprentices and there the class time online tool will also be used. Um, so mechanic, we also have the energy check, energy check in Switzerland and there will also be a quiz. We are also very happy about our cooperation with Pronto, um, with gas stations in Switzerland. This will be carried out in the next three years. So gas stations will also be informed about eco-driving. And we want to represent the eco-driving tips in a more provocative way way and you will also be able to go on our website and participate in a small game about eco-driving tips so these are a number of projects that we have our website is at the center of all of this and we also have the printed material and while we carry out these campaigns, both online and in print, we are also using social media to announce all these measures that we are implementing. Another important point that we have done, all tips have been divided up according to the different types of engine. So now if you go to our website, you can choose whether you want to look at a fuel engine or an electric vehicle, and, and then you will get the relevant tips for that type of vehicle. All this has been included in these separate Tips again, it is all available in German, French, and Italian. And at the end, my last slide, we need to, if you go one step further, 
you can see that we have a film for electric and hybrid vehicles. This little film is also available on our website. I will not show it to you right now, but you can see it on our website if you would like to. That's all from me from Switzerland. And yes, if you have any questions, please write them down in the chat. The mentioned movie, the film, uh, is all, was already posted. The link by Rainer Langendorf, who is also representing the Switzerland EcoDrive initiative in the chat function. Yeah, I need to apologize. We're way uh, back in time, uh, very uh, much too late in this webinar. I just feel there are so many different topics on eco driving in a different country that everybody wants to present just the highlights and these are these are just too many. So I hope that you still uh, find interesting uh, insights. We still have one presentation from from UK waiting and afterwards we will switch to the very interesting driving school part about the topic driving schools electromobility and and eco driving so i hope that you stay tuned uh, despite where we will get uh, a lot of uh, uh, much later than than expected okay so i already invited bob Sainer representing the energy saving trust of united kingdom also a, a partner in previous European projects. I hope that everything is working well with uh, your audio and video and also the share of your presentation. Okay, can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Bob. I cannot see you yet. Probably no, you need to No, I'm, I'm getting a camera. message saying um, the, uh, uh, there's a vi visual problem. So it looks like you'll just uh -huh. have to... Uh, You'll have to imagine what I look like. Okay. To, to, the same as last time, but 10 years older. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how, how long have I got? Oh, um, can you do it in seven minutes? Yeah, probably. Great. If we can get the technology I'm going. sorry for that. Yeah, I'm really sorry. That's okay. Um, let me can you hang on. That's seven minutes. Share your old. screen or shall we help you? Uh, why don't you share it? I think it's probably going to be quicker. Otherwise, it's going to take about three of my seven minutes. You said that we shall try to share it. If you've got it ready to go, then do that. Mm -hmm. OK, I can try it by myself. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, it's already. Well, I've actually hit share now. So if you've got that. Um... OK, yeah, it's working. Wonderful. Thank you. Fine. OK. Uh, Eco driving and electric vehicles. That's the topic. Um, yeah. Moving forward. Let's uh, try to move my first slide on. Okay. <laughs> Fine. So um, it's a pleasure to see everyone. Re really nice to see everyone. But I uh, better not dwell on that. I better get on with things. So we we learned most of what we know about eco driving through European projects. M many of the people involved today. So so it's lo lovely to see everyone again. Uh, in that time, or rather since that time, when we learned so much through those European projects, we we've been busily busily working away. Um, Amongst other things, we've trained nearly 90,000 UK fleet drivers and we've trained more than 1,000 UK driving instructors. Of the, those, dri our, our drivers, driving instructor training always involves um, on-road and classroom, and about half of those 1,000 ha have also um, received EV training. So for, for conventional vehicles, of course, we know the benefits are emissions reductions, cost savings, fewer collisions. For EVs, add in range extension, which is pretty fundamental, isn't it? You know, it can genuinely, driving efficiently can, can make the difference between whether or not you have to stop for a charge en route. For conventional vehicles, so here we are, this, this slide's talking about petrol and diesel. Um, I know we, we all get slight different variations on what, what we emphasize, but much of a, much of a muchness. So in the UK, we, we really focus on anticipation, maximizing engine braking, 
uh, more efficient use of the gears and speed. So if this, this is for petrol and diesel, I'm going to move on now to what, what we believe are the key points for electric vehicles. And there's a lot of similarities. Of, of course, anticipation really remains um, very, very much the key. Uh, maximizing engine braking becomes maximizing regenerative braking. Uh, Cork Cork referred to as recuperative braking earlier, one and the same thing. We usually call it regenerative braking. Um, gears don't come into it unless you've got a unless you've, you're in the market for a Porsche Taycan, you won't be able to buy an EV with gears, and even the Porsche decides itself when to change. So gears don't come into it for EVs, and speed becomes even more of a key factor. Just a, a quick slide on regenerative braking. Um, electric motors and generators are one and the same thing. You know, if you put electricity in, you get movement out. If you put movement in, you get electricity out. And if, if through regenerative braking, most um, most of the, the EVs you can buy can can um, can capture about seventy percent of a vehicle's momentum and put that back into battery charge. So, so if you just think about that for the moment, if you get regenerative braking right. You've got the ability to capture 70% of your momentum. So that, that's clearly the key to efficient urban driving. Um, what can we say that's useful about it? Well, get, get to know the model specifics. So get to know the specifics of the vehicle in question. Certainly if you're delivering training in an EV, you, you need to be familiar with that make and model before you arrive in the morning. Um, for some EVs, the, the level of regen is always low. For example, the early... Not not so much now, but for the early Renault Zoe's, the level of regen is very low. For some, it's always quite high, but for most, it can be changed. You know, if, if you're in a Nissan, it, you change the level of regen by something that looks like a gear stick. If you're in a Kia, it's usually paddles behind the steering wheel. Um, on the Teslas, it's through the big screen. But whatever it is, get to know the the, 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 the specifics of the make and model you're, you're using. And we would say... Uh, and there's a bit of a proviso here, but once you're familiar with EVs, try and stick to the high regen modes. The, the reason for the, the once you're familiar bit, there's of course, there's a potential safety issue. If, if you're not used to the regen and, and therefore the risk, the slowing effect you get in an EV, the danger you need to avoid, obviously, is coming off the accelerator and decelerating much more quickly than you expect. But once you are familiar with an EV, there's no harm in sticking to the high levels of regen all the time because the actual level of regen is always dictated by the position of your foot. So you know, if you're driving along uh, using the motor, then by, by definition that there will be no regen going on. So use the high gens, the, the high levels of regen when you're comfortable too. Speed. I've, I've got two minutes left. That's not very good, is it? Right. Speed. Um, so th this slide is looking at conventional vehicles, ICE, excuse the terminology, internal combustion engines. This is showing us the most efficient speed for petrol and diesels is at the bottom of these curves. You've got speed along the bottom, energy consumption on, on the y-axis. So the most efficient speed for a conventional vehicle is typically about 70 to 80 kilometers per, per hour. For an EV, the most efficient speed is typically about 40 kilometers per hour. Uh, I'm going to miss over the next slide when I was going to talk about why, but we haven't got time for that. Let's just have a look at the effects. Um, and, and excuse these not very nice numbers. Of course, I've translated from miles per hour. I, I couldn't bring myself to uh, round up and down. The scientist in me wouldn't allow it, so we had to go with a literal translation. So petrol and diesel, you can see that 112 kilometres an hour uses around 15, so re re reduced range by about 15%. You can see the figures for yourself. If we then put up the EV range reduction, you can see that the range reduction, or also you could you could be presenting the same percentage figures as energy consumption. The energy consumption penalty with speed is much, much bigger. Okay, so approximately twice as big for EVs than, than, than petrol or diesel. Of course, that doesn't mean EVs are not suitable for um, highway driving, but it just means, you know, go into, go into it all with your eyes open, particularly when you're choosing an EV. Consider the, the sort of driving you normally do and the kind of speed you travel at, and just be aware that high speeds have a bigger effect on EV energy consumption than they do for conventional vehicles. 
Acceleration, however, is the opposite. The acceleration, so sort of faster, harder acceleration, that has less of a penalty with an EV than a conventional vehicle. And once, once again, just to remind you, ICE, ICE stands for internal combustion engine, so it means petrol and diesel. Oh, again, due to lack of time, I'll just put the figures straight up. You can see, I'm oh, sorry, this one does need a little bit of explanation. This middle column, and this is all based on some data that we did, a, um, some EST data. We, I, I managed this project. We took a load of different EVs to a test track and did some very thorough objective testing. And just let me know if you'd like to see the, the full data on this. But we, we, we accelerated EVs uh, very gently at a sort of medium level, average acceleration, and then flat out, foot to the floor, accelerating as hard as you can go. And this shows that the medium acceleration used about, versus gentle acceleration, used about 7% more energy in an EV. Maximum, so, you know, foot to the floor, wheel spinning, well, not quite, but fast acceleration, maximum acceleration in EV used 19% more energy. So there, there are energy penalties, but not nearly as big as the fuel consumption penalties that you would get with petrol and diesel. Um, to be honest, this has left us with a bit of a dilemma. What, what do we do with this information? And we haven't really shouted about it because, you know, there is still an energy consumption penalty, even if it's not as big, there is still an energy consumption penalty. And of course, there's a safety issue, you know, so we are not in the in the business of in, encouraging people to uh, go zooming around at high speed in an EV. But, but we've got the facts and figures. It's good to know that speed affects EV energy consumption more than it does in conventional vehicles, acceleration less. Um, and then the other thing, I think we're on to my, uh, just about my final slide. Um, of course, heating and aircon has a big effect on EVs energy consumption. But in conventional vehicles, we're used to aircon affecting fuel consumption, but in a conventional vehicle, you can just tap into the heat from the engine. In an EV, if you turn the heater on, you're turning on a separate heating circuit. So that will affect your energy consumption and you'll find energy consumption is not so good in the winter. What can you do about it? Um, the main things, apart from you know wearing your woolly hat is uh, in the winter, is uh, try and use the heated, heated seats. You perhaps use this heated steering wheel. C common sense things really, but um, if you can just heat the seat and the steering wheel, for example, and keep the cabin temperature a couple of degrees lower, then that's going to have less of a, an energy cons less of a penalty than if you heat the whole whole vehicle up. Um, overall, we would say, as we always do, we, we, we work a lot with fleets and advising fleets, invest in on-road training. And as Ryan Hudd said earlier, with an EV, almost inevitably, your efficiency training is also combined with product training, training drivers about what, you know, how, what just being comfortable with these new vehicles. So invest in on-road training, understand the model specifics, and when a company is choosing its EVs, Really think about the range. Don't, don't don't focus much on the WRTP figures. Think particularly about the range at the speed that your drivers will typically drive at. Okay, over and out. Okay, thank you very much, Bob, for these very interesting figures. Uh, I'm sorry for the hurry. Uh, if you have any link to get some more information on the figures or to find those in the internet, can you please share it to the chat? I've, I'm uh, pretty sure this will be very interested for a lot of the participants, including for me. Um, yeah, so we are uh, quite late. I was already having a phone call with the organizers regarding the translations. I'm not sure if we can have the interpreters uh, much longer. So if not, then I, uh, yeah, we will we will do it anyhow with, with uh, translation by ourselves if some of the follow-up speakers need to switch to German because the next webinar with the same interpreters is already running. By the way, thanks a lot from the interpreters. And I'd like to come now to the uh, driving school part we have uh, three speakers. Stefan Ebner will start from the Austrian Association of Driving Schools in the Chamber of Commerce, followed up by representatives of the German uh, Driving School Association, Kurt Partels, and also the European Driving Schools Association, Manuel Picardi. 
So I'd like to ask Stefan to share his presentation on eco yeah. Hello, Reinhard. Uh, thank you for invitation. We jump immediately into the presentation. Uh, let's uh, go to the next slide. I would like to speak about uh, two topics, um, eco-driving um, and fuel saving as an important goal of the Austrian driving schools in the driving license training of Austria. And also I would like to speak uh, about uh, electric cars and uh, how we plan that young people get familiar uh, with electromobility in the next months, next uh, years. Next slide, please. Uh, for us, uh, 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 we are very proud of uh, the so-called uh, multi-phase training in Austria. It consists uh, of two phases. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah. Next, yeah. The second, uh, uh, the next slide, please. The Austrian uh, 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 training program in driving schools uh, consists of uh, uh, two uh, modules. Um, above, you see the bar with the uh, first phase, uh, and uh, below, you see uh, the uh, illustration with the second phase. The first uh, phase is the, the ordinary uh, training program to obtain uh, the uh, driving license the first time. You see in Austria, we do have uh, two options to uh, obtain a driving license with a full training in the driving school only, and also with the option by uh, lessons with parents, uh, which substitute lessons in the driving school. The uh, uh, diagram below shows uh, the second phase. And uh, this is uh, very special, the second phase for Austria. We see it as a role model. You see the, 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 the bars uh, uh, which describe uh, these three models, modules in the second phase. Uh, the first on-road skill refinement session, uh, we call it the first perfection ride, uh, and then also uh, a, a so-called uh, road safety training, and then uh, uh, the second on-road skill refinement session. All these models have to be uh, uh, absorbed, have to be completed uh, in the first year after getting uh, a driving license. Next slide, please. He, here, it's uh, easier to see uh, the first um, perfection ride on-road skill refinement session has to uh, be uh, completed uh, in a period of two to four months. Uh, the focus is uh, on uh, correcting bad uh, driving habits uh, on uh, right accelerating after uh, uh, excesses on motorways, for example, or using uh, the cruise control in the right way. Uh, the uh, uh, road safety training uh, is off-road. A training, uh, it has to be a, a passed uh, some months later during the first uh, year, you learn about emergency braking, correctly taking bends, or correctly uh, uh, handling sliding vehicle, vehicles or skidding vehicles. And the innovation for Europe uh, as a role model is the second, second perfection ride. And uh, this second perfection ride I want to describe uh, you now. Uh, next slide, please. The second uh, uh, 
uh, On-Road Skill Refinement Session, this section, second perfection ride, uh, has to be ab absolved, to be passed by every novice driver after uh, six months to 12 months. In the first year, uh, the young drivers have to come back uh, again into the driving school uh, and uh, they uh, learn uh, techniques about uh, economic uh, driving and how uh, to drive uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, consciously and uh, uh, drive in a full efficient uh, style. Uh, we uh, brought this uh, legislation into force uh, 2008 and nearly uh, two million young novice drivers uh, made this program, this module of the second uh, 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 perfection ride uh, during 20 years. And uh, uh, the full saving is about 14%. Uh, the program of the uh, second um, skill refining session is uh, uh, that you drive uh, uh, during uh, 15 minutes for a first ride, uh, you uh, measure the full com consumption. Afterwards, you have a, a deep, in-depth discussion with your uh, driving school teacher about your driving schools and uh, uh, principles about eco-driving. And afterwards, you uh, uh, make this right again, and you could compare the full consumption. And uh, afterwards, you speak about uh, the results. Could you continue? Uh, and uh, you compare these two trips and make uh, an analysis of the results of the two rides uh, in terms of environmental conscious driving and road safety. So uh, this is the great improvement, uh, and I think it's uh, unique for Austria and unique for, it's unique for Europe that in Austria exists uh, such a, a concept of training, uh, bringing young novice drivers again uh, into driving schools uh, and uh, fit uh, uh, their skills and their awareness and their behavior in a uh, further uh, wished direction. And the result of this second phase model in, in Austria is um, great. Um, uh, we could reduce the fatally injured and the casualties. Next slide, please. And especially uh, uh, the uh, fatally insured uh, in the group of the young people, uh, we could reduce uh, uh, by almost two thirds. And the number of casualties uh, declined by one third because of uh, this uh, project of this uh, uh, mo role model second phase in Austria. We brought more safety on the roads and uh, could save full by this strategy. And we recommend this to uh, the European Union. And the second uh, topic I want to mention uh, is uh, we want to bring uh, more electromobility into the driving schools. Uh, we see that the uh, regulations of the European driving license are too strict. And the hurdle uh, that uh, the fleets of the cars in the uh, driving schools are changed uh, to uh, electric cars from uh, cars with manual gearbacks to electric cars or automatic cars. Next slide, please. So uh, we make the, pro the proposal uh, from the situation now, when you make uh, uh, your exam uh, on the automatic car, you get the entry in your driving license code 78, yeah? And your license is restricted to, to, restricted to driving an automatic car. Uh, this is the system and to get rid of uh, this restriction uh, and uh, to become an unrestricted 
driving license, uh, you have to uh, pass at the moment a full exam uh, 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 with, with an examiner from the authorities. And we want to lower the level, the rigidity of this legislation. Uh, next, please. And we want to introduce in the future a, a, a lower hurdle uh, to get an unrestricted uh, driving license, category B, uh, after four lessons uh, of uh, driving training on a uh, car uh, with manual transmission, uh, you should get, next please, an unrestricted driving license. Uh, uh, could you? Yeah. And uh, with uh, a small test, instead of a conventional uh, big test, uh, you should uh, have an easy access uh, to an unrestricted driving license and more electric cars would be used uh, in the driving schools. That's our proposal and I think my colleagues from the other driving schools uh, continue uh, uh, on, on this topic yes. uh, concerning this idea. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. I'm really happy and glad that we have such a strong cooperation partner with the Association of Driving Schools in Austria, which you are representing. The topic electromobility and examination is, I think, a topic from which we can fill a full webinar. So it's just a small insight which we can give now. Uh, I want to mention two things. Bob Sainer has uh, included his email address in the chat. So if you're resting in the reports, which are unfortunately not on online, which he mentioned, please copy the email address and uh, write him an email. He will send you the reports. And uh, second one, we've really lost our translators because they needed to change to another webinar. We are uh, back in time. So uh, we will keep go on in English or probably German. Mr. Bartels, can you hear me? Machen, sprechen. Also erstmal vielen Dank, dass ich dabei sein darf. Ihnen ganz kurz, wirklich mit einigen wenigen Worten, unseren Umgang mit dem Code 78 in Deutschland weitergeben. Wir haben also eine besondere Regelung, die seit dem 1. April diesen Jahres gilt. Diese Regelung besagt, dass wir, wenn die Fahrschüler eine Schaltkompetenzschulung gemacht haben, die mindestens zehn Fahrstunden a 45 Minuten beinhaltet, anschließend wir Fahrlehrer mit diesen Fahrschülern eine Testung machen, dann wird bei der Prüfung eine entsprechende Bescheinigung abgegeben und der Fahrschüler darf auf Automatikgetriebe die Prüfung absolvieren und er bekommt die nationale deutsche Schlüsselzahl B197, mit der er auch im international fahren darf. Und mit dieser Zahl wird evaluiert, ob das Unfallgeschehen durch diese besondere Regelung äh, gesteigert wird, was wir nicht annehmen. Die ersten Reaktionen und die ersten ähm, Ansätze zeigen, dass äh, das wohl sehr gut angenommen wird. Selbst ich habe auch schon Schallkompetenzschulungen und auch Testungen gemacht. Wir haben deshalb zehn Stunden in Deutschland angesetzt, weil alle äh, Fahraufgaben, die wir seit Anfang des Jahres in einem Fahraufgabenkatalog zusammengeführt haben, abgeprüft werden müssen. Vor allen Dingen auch unter der Prämisse umweltschonende Fahrweise. Also Eco-Driving ist auch hier ein Bestandteil. Ähm, ich kann Ihnen auch schon aus den ersten Erfahrungen heraus sagen, dass seitdem diese Regelung bekannt ist, dass sie eingeführt wird, das ist seit ungefähr äh, definitiv dem 9. Dezember äh, letzten Jahres, steigt die Anzahl der elektrogetriebenen Fahrzeuge in den Fahrschulen. Also der Effekt ist wirklich der, dass die Fahrschulen umsteigen und sich äh, elektrogetriebene Fahrzeuge anschaffen, oder auch mit alternativen Antrieben anschaffen, weil ja eben jetzt äh, auch von der betriebswirtschaftlichen Seite her diese Fahrzeuge sehr intensiv im Fahrschulbetrieb eingesetzt werden können. Ich kann also damit nur das, was Stefan Ebner gesagt hat, voll unterstützen. Äh, diese EU-Regelung ist ein riesengroßes Hindernis. Auch in Deutschland ist die Regelung nicht umfassend. Es gilt nur für die Fahrerlaubnisklasse B. 
Erweiterungsklassen haben Probleme, aber es ist der richtige Ansatz, es ist der richtige Weg und wir müssen unbedingt dafür Sorge tragen, dass wir auf der europäischen Ebene eine weitere Öffnung bezüglich der Automatikregelung bekommen. Das war's von meiner Seite. Vielen Dank, Herr, Herr Bartos, für den Input. Ich fasse kurz noch mein Deutsch zusammen, ob ich Sie richtig verstanden habe. Ja. Prüfung mit Elektrofahrzeug äh, zehn, und zehn Stunden äh, Schaltgetriebetraining führt zu einem Führerschein, mit dem man auch äh, Schaltgetriebe benutzen kann. Ich habe nämlich nicht ganz verstanden, die zweite Prüfung mit Schaltgetriebe. Was ist das für eine Art von Prüfung? Ja, das ist, eine, das ist keine Prüfung. Wir nennen das in Deutschland Test. Wir haben den Begriff Prüfung für die richtige, ja. ausgewachsene Prüfung mhm. gehalten. Also diese Schaltkompetenzschulung endet mit einer Testung, die der Fahrlehrer selber machen darf. Das ist also quasi, ich nenne es Und mal so eine Art, ja? Okay. ja, es ist so eine Art Zwischenprüfung, mhm. würde ich es benennen. Wenn er die erfolgreich abgeschlossen hat, dann kann er ja. anschließend auf der Automatik okay. weiter ausgebildet werden, macht dann auf Automatik die komplette Prüfung und kriegt dann B197 mhm. eingetragen. Okay, danke. I will sum up it uh, just in two sentences in English. The view of the German uh, Association of Driver Training Association is that the, that's the EU regulation regarding examination with electric automatic gears is really a big barrier for Uh, the breakthrough of electric vehicles. Uh, just a brief introduction. I will go very fast because we have lost enough time and definitely we are, we are already late. Uh, I'm Manuel Picardi, the General Secretary of the European Federation of Driving Schools. And as the colleague who preceded me, um, we would like to speak about uh, the current situation in the driving training curriculum. Uh, if you see the first uh, slide that I prepared, the, the one after my um, name, is uh, we is EFA. EFA, EFA is the, the European Federation of Driving School. Currently, we represent 23 drive, national driving school associations and uh, different stakeholders and partners involved in the field of training and driver training. Uh, next slide, please. We... Um, We are creating an um, IFA training lab, so it's a, something as an academy who is trying to develop a new methods for um, um, getting a better training and introducing new modules of training. Uh, we as IFA, we, we were partner of uh, EcoWheel uh, Eco project, so with the fr friends as um, um, Tarek Nazal and um, Jochen Law, we have made one of the first steps that our federation has done, we have done together. And uh, currently we are members of uh, an European uh, project uh, called SimSafe, uh, just to understand the role of simulators in the training, but definitely to find new modules of training for getting the license and to become driver instructors. And the IF Academy, so is, uh, as you can see in the picture, as I guess, you, you can see some of the activities that we do um, to re still researching and uh, to define the position of the driving school and the driving instructors across Europe. Uh, next slide, please. You can you had to see the, um, the tables uh, of some of the studies and the documents that we are working on, and, and especially the driving instructors curriculum and uh, the novice driver curriculum. If I well remember on the right side of the screen, you can see the new IFA training matrix. This is our new concept of um, training uh, to be done into the driving school. We uh, would like to present to the DG Move and the European Commission a new system of training because, uh, um, as I already heard before from the, the, the speakers who precede me, uh, the biggest problem today in Europe is that uh, mostly of the people go to the driving school just for getting the license and no for learn properly, no for learn in an eco-friendly way. So we think that some of the, the curriculum has to be done 
uh, by the, evaluated by an examination, but the rest, so the topics concerning the road safety has to be certified by the driving school so that the students can focus on the real uh, problems, the real um, topics concerning road safety. And as you, uh, you can see in the, in the metrics as well, we have indicated a special topics on the eco-driving and e-mobility, because we think that uh, we have to change uh, the current rules. And it's time, we are already late, but it's time to, uh, to speak uh, in deep uh, about this new kind of uh, uh, tr um, driving, uh, traveling. And uh, in the next slide, if you well remember, there is uh, the some position. No, no there is uh, the last um, IFA amendment to the um, MEP Contura, the Greek MEP, who presented a, a new draft study report on the road safety for the new Horizon Europe 2130, um, on which is the right way to follow for the road safety to achieve good results. So in one of the amendments we presented jointly with ATSC, the European Transport Safety Council, as you can see, I guess, in the right box, we defended the idea, the concept that we have to adapt our training and reduce the gap from the law um, following the market. And so we know that our clients, our customers, they are looking for a new kind of training uh, that is matching with uh, the new vehicles. So uh, um, the level two, level three of uh, SAIE uh, scale and with uh, uh, automatic gearbox. And in the next slide, you can see the position paper that IFA on the left side is preparing on the, on the topic of um, uh, code 78 of the driving license. So to remove this, uh, code from the license, and I was already mentioned it by the colleague uh, uh, Stefan Ebner uh, before. We propose uh, at minimum numbers of hour to be done with the uh, manual gearbox, the manual transmission, not passing through an exam, but just certification by the driving school to not have this kind of limitation signed on in. Uh, the driving license. And on the right side of the screen, you have to see the North Territory Union, so are the Scandinavian countries. They, the last year, they presented this position paper to the DG Move, all because they are also living in the same situation with the same problem, and they want to delay this code uh, passing through a certified driving training uh, for getting the license. And um, Okay, I think that I have uh, finished my time. If you see the last slide, you can see our um, reference and the website. You can see some videos and uh, also the, the, the involved the commitment of FIFA on new technologies and uh, eco driving as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your attention and sorry for the technological issues, but okay, it happens. We know. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel Picardi. Um, you have seen the, the link to the uh, films and other material, FAEU.com. Uh, um, it's very good to see that a lot is going on regarding the restrictions on Code 78 for uh, automatic uh, gears. Um, I think that really EU policy is lagging behind the, the modern technology, the electric mobility technology. And so we together, the national associations and the international association of driving schools, I am pretty sure that we can uh, come to a solution in, in a quite uh, short time frame. It's, it's really time now to, to change these restrictions, I guess. Um, yeah, so thank you everybody for a very interesting and very different with various insights in the topic eco-driving, electromobility, driving schools, a very uh, various uh, webinar. Yeah, regarding the time, I can only say when I planned the, the webinar, I thought, yeah, probably we will take five or ten minutes longer. I didn't expect, of course, that we took now more than uh, two hours for the webinar, but I still hope that it was interesting for you. I'm, I'm sure that it was interesting 
otherwise you wouldn't be with us now. Um, and yeah, that's a good sign that we really need to keep on uh, our with our cooperation on international level and to exchange our national activities and and experiences and plans for instance plans especially for the future to learn from each other and to cooperate to follow our common goals so uh yeah now it's time to to end the webinar thank you very much i think we we established we re-established a lot of contacts uh for toward, among the, the eco driving players among europe and we will keep on doing so Great to see you again and see you again soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.